Now there's tremendous echo in this room. Do I get feet? Is there a bit of feedback there? Interesting. Are those microphones? You'd think that they like have a bracket for the for the wire and not just like kind of snoop it out of the out of the ceiling like that. Like you guys ever hear of strain relief? Jeez, they'll be replacing those microphones in like five years. Anyway, I don't know. Maybe they're more than five years old already. But uh, anywho, um, thus concludes the portion of the lecture where I criticize the room that we're in. So, um, I just wanted to bring your attention to this announcement. Um, as I mentioned last time in class, um, next Monday in the afternoon at 2 p.m. in ITB 201, I'm going to be defending my PhD thesis. This might be something that, uh, you know, if any of you have any uh, ideas of going to grad school, this might be something that is of interest to you. Uh, to see what it looks like to have one defended, and that sort of thing. So what I'm doing, lab one is kind of a lightweight, so uh, you got two options. Complete it on your own time over the weekend, or boy, the feedback is really terrible, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, maybe I would just you not use the microphone and speak louder then. Is that preferable? Can you still hear me in the back? Okay. I'll just... Project. So, <clears throat> anyway, so lab one should not be too uh, onerous for you to complete on your own time. Uh, it's a sort of very basic introduction, the type of stuff we were covering last time in class. So, um, on the Wednesday session, you can bring in your results from lab one, have it checked by the TA at the beginning of class. Um, I also personally think it's perfectly feasible for a diligent student to accomplish both Lab 1 and Lab 2 during the Wednesday session, but uh, excuse me, certainly uh, take a look at it ahead of time and see if that's feasible for you before uh, committing to that course of action. At any rate, I'm freeing up the, um, the uh, Monday afternoon lab section so that anybody who's in the class who might uh, be interested in attending my defense may do so. Otherwise, you can take the afternoon off and, uh, you know, go chill at the beach or whatever. Have more fun than I'll be having. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, yeah. So that's, that's how we're going to be doing things next week. Um, any questions? Cool. All right. So... We got a lot of stuff to cover and not a lot of time to cover it in. We move ever swiftly onward to our second topic, version control. So how many people here have ever used any form of version control? Two people. This is good, so uh, you'll be learning something back. So version control, roughly speaking, is software that manages files, right? It's a particular way of managing your files. Managing files in such a way that if something goofs up, you can recover your files to an earlier state. Um, it's also got lots and lots of mechanisms built in to aid collaboration. We're going to be talking about GitHub in a big way um, during this class in general, actually. Um, learning how to use GitHub at least, like, even a little bit um, will sort of elevate your practical software skills uh, quite considerably. But first, before we know, before we learn how to use GitHub, it is proper that we should understand the class of software that we are dealing with. So, Remove code, comment it out until management changes their mind. In real life, code changes a lot over the lifespan of a project. If managing your own code is a royal pain, which 
I'm sure all of you will have noticed, at least from 1MV3, that uh, you know, keeping track of what is or is not in your program can be difficult. Imagine how difficult it is to manage code when you have hundreds of developers working on it. You need a better solution than sending an email with your code in it. Right? That's no longer an acceptable solution to this problem because stuff like this happens, right? And it's not, it is by no means an underestimation to say that large software projects have hundreds of people working on them. Um, relative to the size of some pro software projects, hundreds might be a small number for a medium-sized project, depending on the scale you want looking at things. Like, um, Twitter has something like four or five thousand employees. They all have to manage all of their code, right? Imagine how many people, I think over a million people work for Google, I think, if I recall that correctly. And obviously Google has like many different sub-projects within that, but, uh, you know, I'm trying to give you an appreciation of the scale of the problem. So, Coding as a team. How does one go about working with other programmers? Well, a commonly used approach is to have different developers work on different areas of the code. You get this class, I'll get that class, you write that function, etc., etc. This is also known as the divide and conquer method. This works best. Yeah, you guys remember me talking in 1MV3 about modularity, right? This works best when the developers have a specified and rigid interface between their different areas that they work on. If, de if developer A can rely on developer B's software behaving in a certain way, that simplifies things. He doesn't even really need to talk to developer A very much, right? You can just rely on the interface being implemented as specified. So, in practice, this is pretty common. One developer works on one component, i.e., library files in C. The next developer works on something else. This is also known as code ownership. One might say that, um, you know, Simmons, the programmer, is responsible entirely for um, the physics engine of our video game specifically related to um, bounciness coefficients of various objects. He owns bounciness, right? Pros. Developers don't make changes to overlapping areas of code in theory and developers build expertise with their area of code and can make changes and updates faster. Uh, you kind of become a domain expert on your particular aspect of the project, right? This is also known as division of labor, which as I'm sure all of you with even slight economic leanings know, division of labor is the only thing that has enabled complex economies. So, division of labor is good and we want to enable it. The problem is that human beings, of course, are fallible. We trust developers to stay in their lane, right? Um, but how do we ensure that developers stay in their lane? How do we know that like, some, junior, uh, some junior developer that your company has just hired doesn't like, get into the secret areas of your code base and you know, spill them all to your competitor, some, some ho equally horrible situation, right? So, additional problems. Coding projects don't always break down that easily. Sometimes the modules get large. Sometimes modules get large enough that you want several people working on one of them, right? While Decomposition is a fundamental principle of software design. It can be a struggle to decompose code um, into sort of these kind of manageable units. Two, already mentioned, we're trusting people to stay in their lane. Three, at a certain point, 
the uh, various components do, at the end of the day, need to be integrated into a single final product. It's all well and good for, you know, all of your different developers to be working on each of their individual aspects of the project. In the end, you do need a project to be collecting up all of the work and making it work together. Thus, the problem of multiple developers working on the same code is unavoidable for large projects. In addition, there is the bus factor to consider. So here is a question. If you have a project, and you have a developer who has a particular area of expertise within that project, and they get hit by a bus and die, does your company recover the project? Or does their part, does their portion of the project have to be completely re-implemented because nobody knows how it works, right? Um, you want to try to avoid that situation. It's good to have multiple people who know how to do the thing in your organization. Redundancy is very important, you know, because if you have a sufficiently large organization, even if the, uh, even if the um, you know, probability that any one of your employees is hit by a bus is relatively low, it's multiplied by the number of people there are, right? It's like um, if you have a sufficiently large organization, there's always going to be X percent of, the percent of them who are off sick with one thing or another, right? So, and like, they don't, uh, they don't have to die either. They could just have a long protracted illness and that this, you know, they could have something like, you know, reasonably horrible happen to them, and uh, you know, your project is stalled perhaps for months. Um, you know, basically, um, what's that? What's that? Some Duke Nukem game that took like thirteen years to forever. develop. Hmm? Forever. Yeah, Duke Nukem Forever took forever. You know. Yeah. Because, uh, <laughs> you know, they had to keep. You know, re-implementing stuff. So that'll like restart right. like the entire project with two I think. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it like it's because it take like in particularly in like video games because the the development like it's kind of slowed down in recent years, but certainly in that period from like ninety five to two thousand and five, like the progress was so rapid that like a game from two years ago was unsellable, you know, as a as a current product. So, you know. If it takes too long, you can actually expire the mark. You can you can run out the market for the game, but uh, or product in general. Anyway, so modern problems require modern solutions. Enter version control. Version control systems manage changes to source code and related files in repositories, colloquially termed repos. Um, most of the time you will hear it pronounced repo. Um, so you don't just, like, these are not just good for code. The, um, the versions that I personally keep of all of the course materials for all of the courses I teach, I keep in repositories. Um, because that way I ha always have access to the history and I have, you know, it becomes very easy for me to just, you know, collect the remote version of my repository onto my computer if I change computers, stuff like that, right? Um, repositories make it very straightforward to keep your files up to date with the latest changes. Um, basically, you run a command, it updates your files to whatever the latest version is, right? Whenever changes are committed to the repository, a new version of the files is created. Developers can access older or alternative versions of the files so that detrimental changes can be reversed. Repos are very important in the open source community as they can be used to manage crowdsourced coding projects. So, it's, a, it's, it's several things at once. It ensures code integrity and the ability to reverse problems 
get back to a previous state where your code worked, which is very, very important. It's also a means of distribution, uh, controlled distribution, right? Um, <clears throat> when someone pushes a change to the repository, it is possible for that change to be checked automatically by the repository software to ensure that it doesn't break everything, right? Not to mention, there are several sort of uh, practices of etiquette and hygiene which allow us to um, allow several people to work on the same source code without stepping on each other's toes. Um, so, consider the following problem, right? Um, in software, we have a, we have a problem uh, known as the race condition, right? Where two, um, two programs or users are both racing to perform uh, an operation on one resource, right? So if you think about a file as being a resource, if two people open a file simultaneously, Whoever the last person to write back to that file is, wins, right? So in a way, you're like racing to the end of the num of, of the you know order of people who are writing things to the file, right? Because it's overwriting, right? If um, file A is opened by developer B and developer C, developer B writes their changes into file A. Then developer C writes their changes into file A. Developer B's changes are overwritten. Destroyed. Doesn't matter how many hours they spent on it. Right? The solution in repositories, developer B and developer C both open what are called branches. Right? They, section, they, they take a copy which is their own local version to work on. They do whatever they need to do to work on it, right? Then, at the end, there's a merge step, right? Whatever developer B has done and whatever developer C has done get merged back into one file in a controlled manner that does not constitute direct overwriting, right? So, you know, if you have one file, uh, Person B modifies the top. Person C modifies the bottom. These two files could, uh, these two branches could be merged back into the main branch, um, no problem, right? If they're overwriting the same code, then the repository likely is going to say, "I need a manual intervention to decide which of these two versions of these lines in the file we're going to take," um, which is, you know. It does not remove the problem of people writing different versions to the same part of, of the code. What it does is it exposes it in a controlled manner so that someone with intelligence can correct the problem before it becomes a problem. Right? Does that make sense? Any questions so far? So, let's take a uh, somewhat historical view of version control software by year. So, prior to 2008, um, you know, I don't know, I, I, maybe 2008 is like the end of an epoch, and then after 2008 is the beginning of an epoch, something like that, but anyway. This is the usage, uh, usage numbers for various styles and types of version control software uh, as measured by the number of questions people ask about them on Stack Overflow by year. So, you'll notice, starting things off, SVN was popular. It, it, was, the start, it was the most popular. And it's kind of trailed off and lost a lot of their, excuse me, lost a lot of its um, popularity over time. Um, Mercur Mercurial, Perforce, and CVS were never particularly popular to begin with. And you can see that the clear winner 
uh, as determined by usage by people, has been get. So, um, if you are sent out into the workforce, you may be required to use any of these different version control um, packages. Fortunately, they all work more or less the same. They may have slightly different approaches, slightly different, um, you know, slightly different commands, that sort of thing. But overall, they all do the same thing in the same way. You just have to know how to use them. Right? If you know how to use Git, you, you know how to use SVA. Right? You just need to relearn what the commands are. Make sense? Good. Um, yeah. So we're going to be talking primarily about Git in this class. So what is Git? <laughs> Git was invented in 2005 by Linus Torvalds. Um, this is an amusing picture of him. This was taken from a conference, and this is directed at NVIDIA, because uh, NVIDIA has never like, played nice with Linux with respect to drivers. So he was like, listen, just talk to us. And NVIDIA's like, no. So he gave them the finger at a, at a conference, and I think that's funny, so I put it on the slide. But anyway, Linus Torvalds, that's right. So it's, like, it's the Linux guy, the guy who named Linux after himself, and also invented Git. Um, he named it Git because that's British slang for an unpleasant person, which is what he was called during coding projects because he would be constantly overwriting and undoing people's work. So he wrote Git so that he people would find him less of one. So in a way, he named both Linux and Git after himself. Um, so today, the most popular way to obtain a Git repository is through the internet service GitHub. Uh, previously, you had to pay a subscription for private repositories, but since GitHub was by bought out by Microsoft, uh, private repos are free uh, with some probable limitations on, for example, the number of people who can collaborate on one. Uh, for our purposes in this, um, in this class, nothing you do should require you to pay for a GitHub license. Um, Generally speaking, the way they do these software licenses, and like the, the sort of new model for software licenses for a lot of these companies is um, make it free for like individual people and very small projects. If anybody's attempting to do anything at like, you know, medium or large company size, then charge them through the nose, you know. Um, that way, all of the uh, all of the people like students such as yourselves get to learn how to use this particular software that influences the decisions that companies make about which software to adopt which you know makes their it's like free advertising for them right it's the same uh, it's the same model that the unity game engine has been using for years now uh, to very great effect Despite, the, despite all of the joints in their physics engine being made of jelly. <laughs> it's actually possible to de-jelly Unity physics, but you know, it's just work. So. Um, so while most people now get their repositories through GitHub, I just want to emphasize that it is totally and completely possible to create a local repository on your own uh, on your own computer that is not connected to any kind of cloud service, all right? Like local Git repositories very much exist, are very much in use. Um, it's just you know, like the cloud storage, like free cloud storage of all of your files is just such an appealing thing, you know. Even if Bill Gates can. And, uh, you know, see everything you're working on. So, Bill Gates is not a very good programmer. He's a much better businessman than he is a programmer. I'm just going to say that. And I know you're listening, Bill. Or shall I say William? 
Anyway, um, so so there are a couple of different ways of approaching the means in which uh, the means by which these repositories are stored, right? The traditional model for, uh, for these is the client-server model. This is, uh, this is a model that, for example, SVN uses, right? You have a server which stores its repo on its local disk. Incidentally, anytime you guys see a cylinder on a slide, that means like a, a, a disk of some kind, like, uh, you know, memory, permanent memory storage. Um, it's like... It's supposed to be a um, like a, a symbol, a, like abstract symbol for the magnetic disks that at one point were very popular to compose hard drives. And I know they still use magnetic disks a lot, but we're kind of moving over to uh, solid state because they're faster, even if they have fewer uh, write cycles that they can support. But anyway, so traditionally, you would have a server that holds the data, and that data would be communicated to clients who would not have their own local versions, right? Well, at, at the very least, they would have a local copy, but that copy would not be, you know, privileged with, um, you know, to the point where, you know, client A can look at client B's copy. Client B has to sync with the server in order for client A to then retrieve it. Right? The way that Git uh, does things is using a distributed model, which is a little bit more than, uh, it, it's, it's a little bit more similar to, like, uh, you know, these file sharing services that are mostly dead now from the 90s, you know, like, like LimeWire. Um, basically, each client has their own repository, and they synchronize with each other rather than being synced up to a central database. Um, incidentally, uh, I know like this is becoming like facts about video games class, but <laughs> y'all are fine with that, I'm sure. Um, so the original Dark Souls, right? It uses a distributed peer-to-peer -peer network for its multiplayer communication rather than using a, uh, a traditional um, model for it. So um, that's why, um, like, um, uh, from software or Hasbro or whoever they're, whoever they're, whoever makes the decisions around there, um, decided to shut down the, multi, the multiplayer on Dark Souls 1, like, pro I think, um, very shortly before the release of Dark Souls 3, you know, to try to kick people into the new version. Uh, but a very simple patch uh, that was developed by, you know, some people uh, of ill repute, where uh, it only took a very simple patch to put it back online. Basically all it had to do, like, the whole thing was coordinated through, like, an active player list, and all, it had, all they had to do was take that and, you know, re-implement a very small portion of it, and everything was back up and running exactly the way that uh, you would have expected with the PC version for Dark Souls, because they use a peer-to-peer -peer network rather than a traditional network. This is actually a, a good, like, business model with respect to, um, you know, multiplayer communication and other sorts of things, uh, because if you are running the server, you have to pay for it. If your server operations are distributed across your user network, then they're paying for the server, right? Each one of their, like, laptops is a mini version of the server, so you don't have to pay for as much of it up front. Um, but yeah, anyway. So, Git in started. So even if GitHub is hosting your repository, you will need software installed if you want to do uh, if you don't want to do everything in a web browser. So with us, obviously, this is a class on how learning how to do things from a command line. Git permits 
command line behavior. So, if you go to this website, git-smc.com slash downloads, you can, you can get the current version of Git for whatever platform it is that you're operating on. And uh, we're getting to the point with these things where I no longer patronize you by telling you how to do things for your particular operating system. You should start to understand how to do things for your op the operating system that you're running. So, in general, Graphical user interfaces are fine to use, but the command line is usually faster and can be integrated into scripts, etc. A professional software developer is expected to understand how to use the command line version. Again, you can integrate it into scripts much, much more easily. So, um, Actually, I think I can. I'll show you one of my scripts. So, this is kind of like a just kind of an interesting case study. Um, incidentally, all of these are private. All of these repositories I'm about to talk about are private. So you can't just like go to my GitHub page and get access to these uh, because you know they contain exams and students' insert information and stuff. So it's like keep you out, but that's okay. Um, each one of these is, um, contains a repository, right? I have a script, a shell script, called gitsync.sh, which synchronizes my copies of all of my repositories to the, their cloud versions on GitHub um, like very, uh, very easily. So, <clears throat> I have a file called repos in which all of the uh, repositories I want to sync, they're all listed in that file. Let me just open that file too. There you go. These are all the repositories that I keep, right? <coughs> this script reads that file. <coughs> Pardon me. So for each of those repositories um, where um, basically I store it uh, I store the uh, directory the repository is in the variable repo. This we haven't done shell scripting yet, but uh, you know this may be an interesting first look at it. Um, I change directory into uh, the uh, you know teaching directory. Then I change again into the directory for the repository as listed in that file. I pull the latest changes. I add any files which have been added since. You know the latest change was made. I commit with a uh, with a message auto commit. If you look at my repository, like all of my uh, like pretty much all of my uh, maps, all of my uh, commit logs are auto commit, auto commit, auto commit. Which is you know not good practice, but whatever. Uh, don't you do it? But I'm going to do it. Um, <laughs> do as I say, not as I do. Uh, and then I get push all of the committed changes out to GitHub, and that synchronizes everything up. Then finally, I, um, I like change directory, directory back to the current working directory I was in uh, when I uh, executed the script. So, to see what that looks like running, all I have to do is execute the script, Right? So, in Linux, if you want to execute something which has executable permissions, including shell scripts, dot slash, then the name of the thing you're executing. And basically right now it's going out and, uh, you know, in real time, fetching all of the changes that I think maybe one of my TAs made to uh, the 1MP3 repo or something. 
but uh, yeah, it's synchronizing the uh, it's synchronizing the the repository as we speak, and you can see that for all of the rest of the repositories, everything was up to date. Cool, right? Like one one line of code, and I've just synchronized all of my repositories with the cloud, right? And you can too, if you just pay attention in this class. So, but that being said, it's useful to know how to set one up that's not cloud synchronized. So, uh, you know, it's like, um, if you know how to do it from the command line, then you know how to do it. And then you, like, the cloud stuff is like an add-on to base functionality, right? So, <clears throat> let's just uh, get into a uh, working directory, examples, so, there we go, uh, make directory top F2, there we go, so, To change a directory into a git directory, or a git synchronized directory, all you have to do is type git init, initialized empty git repository in home slash nick slash teaching slash 1x33 summer 2022 examples topic 2 dot git. So you remember me saying that uh, anything prepended with a dot character is a hidden file or folder? The only thing that distinguishes a git folder is the presence of this subfolder, which is a hidden folder. Basically, the git program will look for this folder. If it doesn't find one, then it's not a git repository. So you can sort of um, eliminate a thing as being a git repository just by deleting this folder. Um, but you can also do that through git itself, and that's somewhat safer than messing around with plots of the folders yourself. But uh, so, listing all, you can see I've got dot git in there now. If we take a look inside, navigate into the hidden folder, you can see we've got all kinds of information, configuration, description, head, hooks, info, objects, refs, branches, etc., etc. Um, there are some cool things that you can do by knowing how to get into the Git folder itself. Um, there's a, um, oh, I forget what the file name, I have to look it up, but, um, oh, it's .git ignore. Um, I think it's in the exterior folder, actually. You don't have to put it in here. But anyway, if you create a git ignore file, you can tell the, uh, you can tell Git to ignore files of uh, certain file types. So, for example, uh, in Git repository, like in GitHub particularly, um, large zip files are generally rejected by GitHub. Like if you have a zip file that's over like 20 megabytes or something, they'll say, nope, that's exceed that exceeds our maximum file size. You are not allowed to synchronize that. And then that, uh, you know, It'll choke on that, and then you're like, you don't even get a commitment. You know, you don't get the commit after that because it choked. Um, but <clears throat> if you include a git ignore that tells git to ignore zip files, then everything will work. It'll just ignore the fact that this zip file exists. Now, of course, the zip file won't be sent to the repository. It will stay only in your local git uh, repository. But um, you know, that might be fine. You know, it depends on the application. Um, does that make sense? Am I talking? Yes? What is the difference between it committing and it pushing? Ha. We're going to be talking about that. Okay. Yeah. Um, basically, um, the process occurs in two steps, right? Okay. The local, the local repository that I just created, mm -hmm. Um, 
only has the ability to commit. Right. If I were to sync it up to GitHub, that I would works. have to commit and push. Okay. Push is the operation that, well, pushes any locally made commits to the version that's up on, uh, on GitHub. Okay. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. Yeah, it's a, it's a system that makes sense, you know, if you think about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> any other questions? Cool. So, um, yes. Oh, and uh, if I didn't mention this before, the A option on LS stands for all, and it views all things including hidden files and folders. Good. So, <clears throat> Git workflow. This is mainly rules of etiquette for using Git repositories in such a manner that you're not uh, interfering with other people's work. So, here are some general procedures for working in a repository. These are applicable to other version control systems. In a repo, files and directories are either tracked or untracked. So, you know I was talking about um, uh, zip files. You can tell Git to ignore them. Um, well, that step that I put in my script, git add, uh, git add dot, uh, it's a recursive operation. It tells git to look for any untracked files that exist in the, in the folder and then track them, right? So um, one of the things that you have to do with a repository is you have to tell the repository what things to keep track of and which things that it doesn't have to worry about, right? Um, this has generally, like, uh, with other, like, less popular repository software, uh, like, or pieces of software, like SVN, you have to, like, manually go in and add all of the, uh, all of the um, files that aren't tracked anytime you add a file to the repository. And as you can imagine, you probably add files to a repository reasonably frequently, you know? One of the reasons Git is very popular is because its add function is like, it's like, an, it's like um, you know, global add with a blacklist, which is much better than like having to specifically go in and whitelist every file that you want to add. You know, um, it's just more convenient to use, right? But you do have to add files in order for them to be to be tracked, right? So. Only tracked files and for folders are part of the repository. So, you know, if you have a zip file in there which is not being tracked, any changes to that zip file will not be reflected in the repository history. For example, files and folders must be added to the repository manually, albeit with varying degrees of automation. Uh, Git being highly automated, SVN being quasi-automated. As you work on files, periodically commit your changes to the repository. Uh, you can kind of think of this as super saving your work. Uh, you know, um, saving it just saves it to the hard disk. Committing it saves it to the hard disk in such a manner that you can return to that save at any point in the, in the future. Right? Um, if you're working on a networked Git repository, which is probable, you will also have to push your commits to the network. Doing this every time you commit is a good idea. Uh, you know, depending on circumstances, of course. But uh, your general workflow, right? When you start working on something, git pull to grab any changes that someone else may have made, right? Do your work, git add any files you added, git commit when you're, you know, you when you want to save to the repository, and then git push so that other people who are pulling can see the changes you made. Right? Make sense? Uh, a lot, a lot, a lot of problems are caused by missing that first step. Always, always, always pull before you do anything. 
make sure you're working on the latest version. So, good. So, let's review some of the simple commands. Uh, we're not talking about servers or uploads, downloads just yet. Um, this, these are the commands for local Git repositories, but they are also applicable to networked repositories. So, git add file name tells git to track the specified files and folders. If you put dot here, we all remember the dot refers to the folder that you are currently inhabiting. Right? Add is recursive on folder structures. So if you add a folder, it will add everything in that folder. So if you specify the current folder, it will add everything in the current folder and anything in any subfolder. So it's a very powerful way of just, you know, git add dot just adds everything that's not uh, already being tracked by the repo. So you can also add multiple files. So git add f1, f2, f3 adds files. And git add star dot c adds all files with a C extension. Um, this is known as a glob pattern, just so you know. We'll be talking about glob patterns a little later in the course, but I think pretty much everybody's seen something like that, right? No? You haven't seen um, star dot file extension to represent all files of, of a particular file extension? Um, Okay, well, I guess I'll talk briefly about what glob is and, then, and does then. Um, so glob is a program that is very deeply embedded inside of Linux and uh, Bash particularly. Um, what it does is it searches directories and expands file names. So star is a wildcard character representing um, any number of characters. Right? So, uh, I think I can, let me, let me just whip up a quick example here. Let's say I had um, a.text, b.text, and c.c. Oh, wait, I just made that noise. Oops. <laughs> Whoops. I was in the wrong directory. <coughs> So, anyway, so I'm in the topic 2 directory right now. Oh, by the way, I'm not sure if I tell, told you guys this yet, but one of the very, very useful things about command prompts is you can scroll through previous commands with the arrow keys. So, I just performed an operation in the wrong folder. If I scroll back up to the wrong operations, operation which I performed, enter it again, I don't have to do the typing over again. So, incidentally, the touch command does two things. It creates files, and it updates timestamps to the current time. Actually, it has the ability to update timestamps to any time, uh, which is why the only proof of on-time uh, 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 performance of work is on-time submission of work because timestamps can be modified. They are not, like, they are not an immutable record of past events. So, um, yeah. <clears throat> so anyway, I have these three files, right? Echo is a command that uh, just prints out to the, uh, to the command line whatever it's given. So, like, for example, if I said echo hello world, it echoes hello. Yeah, there you go. You just got the hello world in, in shell scripting. Boom. Echo is like print, right? So what what's going on here, when I echo star.text. This command is first fed into a command called the glob. 
blob searches the contents of the current folder for anything matching this pattern and then expands it, right? So although I have written star.txt, what the echo command actually sees is a.txt, b.txt with a space in between. All right? So that's what a glob pattern does. So um, basically, star.file extension is shorthand for all files of a particular file extension. Anything matching like this, you can think of it as like pattern matching, right? Um, and you can put those things anywhere. Uh, so, like, star dot star is all things with a file extension, right? Um, if I had, like, touch A, B, B, A, B, A, and C, B, A, right? Then echo A star, um, oh, oh, ooh, yeah, never do that. Try to avoid uh, including glob pattern characters and file names. Terrible idea. Um, you can see it didn't work. So, echo a star matches a b a a b b and a dot text because you know star represents any number of characters, right? Echo star itself is just the names of everything in the folder. Um, B star, uh, star B star matches anything that has a B in it, including things where the B occurs at the beginning, because a uh, star can also represent no characters. Make sense? Okay. Cool. All right. Um, incidentally, this is like just what this class is going to be like. <laughs> so. Um, <clears throat> There's a lot of information like that you need to know to be able to use these types of tools, and it's not all in the slides, and I'm probably just going to jump in on tangents whenever anybody doesn't know anything. So, there you go. You got a question, sir? Uh, what kind of file is ABA? Oh, it's just a file without a file extension. At the moment, it's empty. Yeah. Um, file extensions don't really exist. Um, all they are is a tag that tells programs like which files are meant for them, right? There's nothing inherent about the file extension ex itself which has any effect on the contents of the file, right? Un like, unless the file has been tagged as binary a binary file instead of being character encoded, but that's it. That's that's uh, that's encoded elsewhere in the file information, right? Um, all of these are just plain text files, right? Um, make sense? Any other questions? Is it fun learning how computers work? Yeah. Question? Uh, what's the usage of hash? Oh, um, it creates files and it also updates timestamps to the current time. Yeah, so uh, if I need to create a file, I'll probably create it with touch. Um, the other, like, opening it in a text editor and then saving it also does the same thing, but, uh, you know. Touch is just so easy, you know. Anyway. So, we now have a bunch of fi files in this, in, this, uh, in this folder. Let's modify one of them so that it actually contains something. So get it a.txt. I am the very model of a modern major general. Save. There we go. So we now have one file that contains something. Hat a.txt. There you go. Right? So git add star or dot. What we've done with this command is we've queued up the entire contents of this folder 
before being added to the repository on the next commit, which we are about to perform. Git commit message initial commit. So, six files changed, one insertion. Uh, that, that, that is to say one file content modification. Um, all of these things have been added to the repository and a commit has been made. So, git commit commits everything in the working directory and all subdirectories recursively. Uh, again, this is a, diff this is a distinction um, it's easier to do this, slightly easier to do this in Git than in something like SVN, which is why Git has one. Git, uh, so Git commit expects a log message, which may be specified using the dash M flag. If no log message has been provided, it will prompt you for one. Right? If you fail to provide one, Git will open up a text editor, like now, because you probably just forgot to do that, right? It's not like you would ever dream of committing something to a repository without including a message. That's clearly this horrible and atrocious violation of etiquette. It's just a mistake on your part, right? Um, descriptive log messages are important. Important like good commenting habits. Probably more important than good commenting. Um, someone who's looking at, like, if you're working on a project with someone, right, the first place someone who's in the know will look to see what's going on with the project is in the message, the log messages, not in the source code. The whole point of this is that you don't have to get into the source code any more than is necessary, right? So, descriptive log messages. <coughs> So, this funny little guy is Octocat. Octocat is the mascot of GitHub. You will come to love Octocat with the same Stockholm Syndrome that you come to love Tux the Linux Penguin. So, some more basic commands. Git status displays the status of the current state of the repository relative to the last commit. So any changes that have been made, any files which are not being tracked, and whatever your current working branch is, don't worry, we'll get to branches. These are all things which are displayed by git status. So for example, if I were to update the file that I was working on, I have information animal vegetable and mineral. Get status tells me that I have changes not staged for commit and I, oh that's very difficult to read isn't it? It's red text I apologize, red on black, terrible, but it says modified a dot text. Um, on branch master. So the default branch, which is created when you create a new repository, is called master. Um, all branches branch off of master and are hypothetically uh, merged back into master later on when you're finished with the branch. Um, so yeah. Um, yes. There we go. Git log displays the history of the project. So, you can see I may commit number that to master on this state with this commit message from this user and you can view all of these things, right? Uh, there are a couple of options on this which uh, make it even nicer. Um, 
but we'll um, we'll get there. We also have git checkout, which is very important. Um, tracks your ch uh, this changes your tracked files to the specified commit or branch. You can undo this. These cha uh, this allows you to undo changes and navigate the repository. So any commit is a checkpoint. If you check out a checkpoint to return your repository to the state it was at that checkpoint. Maybe you just want to see the files in the state they were, were, they were at that time. You can check out the previous version and then check out the head of the branch again to just kind of, kind of jump back to where you were so long as that as so long as you committed before you checked out. Make sense? Um, so, you, the way that you check out a commit, you either enter this guy, or a shortened version of this, or um, some things have names. So you can also refer to things by name. If you want to check out the master branch, you just check out master. If you want to, have, if you have a named branch, you want to check out, you know, you provide the name of the branch, right? So, <clears throat> is this making sense? Mm -hmm. You guys, any questions? Mm -hmm. Oh, at the back there. What is the dash m command? Dash m? Um, say again? In the commit command? Oh, uh, that, that is an option saying the next argument is the commit message. So, we're going to see more of this type of form. Um, not all options, like, we're used to seeing options like A in LS, which does not require any additional arguments, right? It just does a different mode. A lot of options require additional arguments. So, M, for example, requires um, the message itself, right? So, you provide it as the next argument. Um, Another situation where we're going to see this, when we start doing C compilation from the command line, um, dash O allows you to specify a non-default output file name for the executable, right? Uh, but you have to provide that name. Make sense? Any other questions? These are really good questions, by the way. I can tell this is a good class. I'm excited to be teaching you guys for once. Man. <laughs> 1MB3 was a rough. Uh, anyway. So. <clears throat> the master branch is the default branch created with, I kind of already said this, but I'll say it again. I have a graphic now. Uh, the master branch is the default branch created within the repository. The head of that branch is just the most recent commit. Right? Uh, checking out a branch automatically takes you to the head of that branch. If you want to go to another branch and then somewhere in the history of that branch you'll need a commit number. Make sense? Generally speaking, you'll want to be doing things in the heads of branches anyways. Yes? Can you like, specify a name for the commit? <coughs> um, generally speaking, it's not worth your time to specify the names for individual commits. Um, hopefully, you'll be making enough of them that like picking a name for each of them is just like more time than you want to spend on it. Um, it's it's uh, pretty, like, you don't have to enter that big, long thing. Um, uh, you can say git uh, log one line. You can use this shortened version, uh, which is much easier. Uh, but we didn't talk about one line. It's further in the slides. I just wanted to introduce the idea of the log. Anyway. Um, so, okay, how are we doing for time? Ah, oh, we still got an hour. Okay, so. So what's the point of this again? All of the foregoing repository management stuff is, you know, great and all, but it's still likely overkill for many of your local tasks. Um, you know, generally speaking, the save system 
of any particular computer is probably going to be adequate to your needs. And uh, Git repository is probably uh, overkill for most of the stuff that you're doing, unless you're doing, you know, software development and don't trust yourself, which you shouldn't. <laughs> anyway, um, it's more applicable than you might think, uh, since a project of any particular size benefits from this approach, but where things really come alive is your ability to network repositories and do an internet. So, git clone creates a local instance of a remote repository. Generally speaking, the workflow for creating, for example, GitHub repositories, you log into GitHub, you create the repository, set up all the settings you like, give it an initial file, all of that nice stuff, and then you clone it locally. GitHub will actually provide you a copy-pasteable uh, command that you, all you have to do is paste it into your command line and clone the repository. Git push transmits commits to other networked repos. So when you make a commit, it does not automatically sent over the network. You must commit and then push for other people to be able to see it. Git pull receives commits from other networked repos and checks out the current head in whatever branch you have active. Any, uh, any questions? We kind of have already talked about a lot of that. So, so a quick note on URL addresses. To clone a repo, you first have to know where it is and what protocol you're using. Right? So, SSH gets HTTPS. These are all different protocols that you can use to send information back and forth from the Git repository. So, you know, it's not necessary for you to know all of this long stuff. Um, it's important for you to know that these different protocols exist and that they're dealt with in slightly different ways, right? Um, excuse me. Password authentication is better on some of these than others. Some of them are more secure than others. SSH uses the SSH protocol from uh, PuTTY that we were talking about last class, for example. HTTPS uses the standard web protocol that's used for web pages, which is, you know, not as good or secure. It's not really designed for it, you know, but uh, it's still very common. So. If your repo is being hosted by GitHub, they have a handy button that you can use to get the correct URL. Um, so yeah. Question? Yes, the uh, URL means we, we, we store the resources in other... Uh, uh, I, used the URL, I used the URL before. It is like, I mean, but it's hard to, it's hard to it's describe. So, okay, ask this later. So, I, I think I can answer your question. Yeah. A URL is a web address. Uh, it's very, um, very similar to absolute addressing within a file system. The way that the internet thinks of itself is as a huge distributed file system, right? Um, what you do when you access a web page on the internet is you say, in the gigantic file system that constitutes all of the computers hooked up to the internet, I want this one, right? And then, you know, a lot of the information on how to get there is hidden from you because it's, you know, a lot of numbers. But, you know, you request a web page at a particular address, the server then sends that to you and it's displayed on your computer and stored in local memory. Uh, you know, you don't, you download certain resources with respect to web pages, but not the whole thing, obviously. Um, make sense? A little bit? Question? So, every, so, so okay, for example, so every picture has a unique address in, in the internet, and the URL is used to like, get, get text in. Yes. Yeah. yeah, like, um, you know, if you were to, um, you know, 
search um, fuzzy kitten picture, right? This picture of a fluffy kitten, if you copy link address, right? This address is the position within the internet's gigantic distributed file system at which that image exists. Make sense? When my search engine displayed that image for me, it retrieved it from this address and displayed it. Make sense? Yeah, well, yeah that's what I use. Yeah. Uh, on the mm -hmm. uh, any other questions? Now that we know how the internet works? <coughs> So, let's see here. <clears throat> yes. So, um, is there anybody in the room who doesn't have a GitHub account yet? Get one. Get one. Get one. Get one. Get one. Get free. Ooh, sorry. So. Sign in. Uh oh. Ha. All right. Boom. Boom. All right. So, if I create a new repository on GitHub, this is this is the procedure, right? New. You pick a repository name, say summer example. It'll check to make sure it's available. Description optional, public or private. I'll make it private. Um, da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da, create repository. Quick setup. Blah, 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 blah. Just um, you know. a new file, there we go, so call it temp. Um, Git is kind of interesting, it doesn't, it doesn't consider a folder to exist unless it's got something in it, so you have to add a file. Question? Yeah, uh, when you create your GitHub account, do you use our personal email or the master? Um, I have both. Yeah, it, uh, it um, doesn't really matter to me um, which email you use. Um, whichever one you want. <laughs> Question? I, I use the GitHub to upload my upload my log files, but there is a limit of the number of the set of files. You can't. It's uh, like file size limitations are strictly set by the server, and there's really like maybe you can get around it by paying for premium. Okay. Yeah, but my my most have like my most like over hundreds of files and I have this separate theme and sometimes I mess. I mean like I forgot which file I have uploaded, which not. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, yeah, really. So I've created a temporary file, temp. It contains nothing. Uh, incidentally, the GitHub website contains its own editor. So you can modify files, and anytime you save a file on GitHub, it creates a commit automatically. Um, so there you go. So temp is created. If I want to take this and produce it as a local repository, grab a copy of it, clone the rep repo as it were. You can see I grab that, copy the URL address. I'll use HTTPS just because. Um, CD, there we go, and then I'll just do it in this folder, git clone, there we go, let me just make sure I'm using all the right options, paste, cloning, unpacking, etc, etc. Now, I have, config I have configured my local installation of git to automatically provide my login credentials to GitHub. So otherwise, they would, there would be an, an additional step here 
where you would be requested, a username and a password would be requested, and an authentication token. So um, <coughs> I have that already set up, so it just does it for me. So you can see summer example has been created as a folder in the current folder. We navigate into it, cd summer example. <coughs> We see the file temp, which has been created on GitHub. We can look, view its contents, view its contents, mm -hmm. and that's what I entered it on GitHub, right? We can even modify it. Save. We can get commit message minor changes. There we go. Oh, maybe get add all first, then get status. There we go. Yep, there we go. Um, Changes which have not been queued are in red. Changes which have been queued are in green. So we have to do the add step there. Um, then we can commit. There we go. Then get push. There we go. Now, if I look at the file in GitHub, ta-da! Bing, bang, boom. The modifications show up. Nice, simple, plain, easy. Question? Can we go back after add? Sure. Thanks. I just uh, requested status to view whether this um, file was queued for committing. Okay. Yeah. Good. So, git log. You can see I now have two commits in the repository, um, creation and minor changes. Question? Why do you have to add it if it was made in the repo? Um, the changes weren't being tracked. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think I might have, I think I might have had a slight deviation from truth in something I said previously which was that only, uh, only untracked things need to be added. All changes need to be added when you're committing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just add every time, and everything will work out. Any other questions? OK. So, so now we know what the internet is and how to use it. <clears throat> so, some notes on collaborative workflow. When working on a project with humans, it is considered courteous to always per pull the latest changes before you start working. Otherwise, you will cause merge conflicts which perhaps don't need to be there because you're trying to merge old versions into new versions. Always push your changes promptly when you're finished Document your changes, period, exclamation mark. Any major changes, such as new features, should be made in a separate branch and then merged back into master when the feature is mostly complete. So major changes, you know, new features, stuff like that, should be done in a separate branch. And we're going to talk about branches. So, as a developer, it is your job to keep master stable at all times. It is the expectation of software developers and the software industry and software, like open source projects and everybody who matters in the world, that the master branch contains a working copy of your code. Right? 
Master should always work, right? If you're making changes that have the pop, even the slightest or most remote possibility of interfering with the operation of the code in the master branch, it is your responsibility to open up, open up a new branch, make your modifications there, test it to make sure that it frigging works, and it only, in the event that it doesn't break everything, attempts to merge it back into master. So, adding a feature or even general development will often break things for a while, and pushing broken code into master is the height of bad manners. Once your branch is finished, you can merge it back into master with minimal effort. This way, people's changes remain isolated throughout development. So, for example, let's say we had master, right? After this commit, you pull off a branch, you work on branch, do a few commits, right? Then, at a certain, the development on master continues. Someone else pulls off at a later date, you merge back in while they're working on it. They merge in after you've merged in, and everybody's happy. Nobody's, nobody's, nobody's interfered with anybody else. Everything's fine. If, however, both you and someone else were all modifying master, you would definitely be interfering with each other, now, particularly if you're working on the same set of files. Make sense? Um, basically, try not to catch yourself in merge conflict purgatory. Um, merge conflicts can assume biblical proportions. So, so how does one go about creating these mythical branches? It's easy. You just say git branch, specify a branch name. This creates a new branch with the given name. However, um, it, you, it doesn't automatically switch you into the new branch, so you'll have to switch in yourself using switch which switches the specified branch. It's kind of similar to, um, to the checkout operation, uh, but it's a little less, um, it's a little more compact in form. So, similar in, uh, yeah, so git switch is similar in effect to changing the working directory in a file system. And we have a new option for git log, all, which displays commits from all branches, not just the active branch. So, um, let me give you a little bit of a demo. So let's say, um, git branch, um, call it, um, you know, um, feature, one, right? Um, get, uh, let's make further modifications here. There we go. That's a modification. So, get status. Your branch is up to date with, uh, we are on branch main. So get status tells you what branch you're on, right? Uh, incidentally, um, git on its own calls it uh, calls the the um, calls master master, but if you're on GitHub, it calls its name. I'm not sure why. It's like a minor deviation in uh, in nomenclature. So if you see main, it also means master. Um, anyway, so git add dot git commit message whatever there we go git push right switch to feature one um, oh git switch pardon me switched to branch feature one if we take a look at the contents of temp you can see 
the contents are as they were before we branched. Right? The latest commit to master has had no impact on the contents of this file. So let's make some modifications. Get its temp. There we go. Let's insert the line um, yes and more as well. Save that. Get add. Get commit. Message. Also, whatever. There we go. Hit push. There we go. Fatal. Current branch feature one has no upstream branch push. Sometimes it'll just say uh, the command you've entered is like not complicated enough, so please use this one instead, and you just do, and most of the time you don't even have to think about it. Um, so, it sometimes does that. So, if we take a look at the status of things in the summer example repo, um, you'll notice that we now have two branches. We have main, and we have feature one. If we take a look at the status of um, this guy, you'll see that's the main branch. If we take a look at the, if we switch to feature one, take a look in there, you'll see we have the feature one version. Make sense? Okay. That's not too complicated, right? Um, it gets a little more complicated when you realize that branches can have branches. So um, branches can have branches can have branches. You can branch any branch, right? So these things can get kind of complicated. Um, get log all one line graph. All one line graph. And I know this is also in red, so it doesn't show up very well. But this gives you the commits in all branches, compacts them to one line so that you can like view them as the graph view more easily. And also, graph shows you the points at which the repository branches uh, have been formed and uh, where they get merged back in as well. Make sense? Um, this is a very important way to view the branches in a repository. So, good. And there you go. Get log all the graph gives you a visualization. Uh, without the one line, you can see it like includes the entire information there, right? Uh, one line just makes it compact so that you can see more than like four commits on a screen, which is useful. So you may notice on GitHub one of the popularity <coughs> indicators which you have. Incidentally, GitHub kind of functions. Uh, a teensy weensy little bit like a social media site in that public repositories have like popularity statistics which are tracked like how, like you can watch other people's repositories to be informed of like latest releases and you can even um, <clears throat> if it's public then other people can take your repository and fork it so forks are a little bit like branches but uh, over an entire repository. It's like copying someone else's repository. Um, so one of the popularity metrics for your code project on GitHub is the number of times someone, some other coder has found it useful enough to say, I want a version of that, but I want to do this with it. And that's not working with your project, so I'm going to do my own. 
That's what a fork is. So, forking is often used to start a new project from an existing one. A famous example, LibreOffice, which is a, um, it's like uh, the office software that comes by default with Linux. Um, well, depending on your distribution, of course. It was forked from OpenOffice in 2010 because some of the OpenOffice community members didn't like how Oracle uh, did its licensing for previous open source projects. So essentially, you had some people working on OpenOffice, which was a, um, you know, an open source office software project, right? Quite popular at the time. They became disgruntled, took the source code and forked it so that they could do their own thing with it and not have to worry about what Oracle was doing or its licensing. Um, this is kind of the same way that, uh, you know, the GNU project branched off from the original Unix. Um, so it turned like it turns out, history declared these guys the victors, because Open Office. If you actually open up o Open Office, um, it's like when it's like uh, Word ninety five. Like it's very very antiquated by modern standards. Like still functional, but not like. <coughs> Not compatible with some of the new file like uh, file types, and like it's showing its age because like active development isn't very active on it. On the other hand, LibreOffice uh, does have quite active development and has been maintained much better. And they've you know included all, they've you know stolen the ideas from many of the new features that like commercial Office products have been using and that sort of thing. But um, but yeah. So LibreOffice ended up being the victors here, but that you know isn't necessarily the case. But yeah, it was a fork. Um, there's no command for forking with Git, but many Git uh, GUI tools have a button for it, including GitHub. So if you, um, so in this course, Lab Three is going to require you to fork a, Git repo a GitHub repository that I have personally. Um, it's like, it's like um, you know, maybe one quarter of a chess game. Um, your, uh, your task in lab three is to fork my repository, my, my chess game repository, um, which has been intentionally designed to be a merge conflict hell. And your job in lab three is simple, all you have to do is fix it. Um, people hated it last year, Lab 3. So I imagine you guys will have fun with it and also probably hate it. But uh, they're, like, if you want to learn, like if you want to develop the skill of working with Git repos, fixing a broken repo is like a, an extremely valuable exercise. If you don't have the commands memorized now, you certainly will by the end of Lab 3. So, uh, you will know what it means to switch branches. So, <clears throat> so let's talk about merging then in the last 15 minutes of class. So, in order to merge, you, you type git merge and then you specify the name of the branch that you're merging. It merges the specified branch into the currently active branch. So. It's not, um, you kind of have to think of your position within the repository. It's not like, I am in this branch, I want to go over here. That's not the operation. The operation is, I am here, I want to grab this thing and merge it into me. So it's like, get over here, and you force it in. So you can see which branch you're on by using git branch uh, with no arguments or by using git status. Merging requires a commit message, and git will prompt you uh, with one uh, with a text editor if necessary. So when merging, the merge process itself creates a commit. Make sense? Otherwise, like you're not saving the work in the repository of the merge itself, right? So Git is pretty clever at merging branches, but there is always the possibility of conflicts. Um, if the changes are in different files, in different branches, the merger is trivial. 
Um, basically, what it does is it goes through each file, examines those files for the, the points of difference within them, and anywhere the, um, like, you have a, like an addition somewhere but no corresponding addition in the other side, it just pops that addition into, uh, you know, pops that addition in. Um, the problem is if, like, and it goes generally by line, like by line number within the file, so the problem that you'll, like the problem that creates merge conflicts is if you have two files which have the same, um, the same line that's been modified in two different ways. So we'll see how it goes. We're going to, uh, we're going to see if this creates conflicts. So if changes are made in different parts of the same file, merger is trickier, but it will probably work. If changes are made in the same part of the same file, Git probably won't be able to figure it out. So Git takes the, uh, it takes an, sort of an agnostic approach to merger. It's like, um, I don't know what your source code does. All I know is this, yeah, all I know is which line numbers have been modified since the last commit. So uh, if I find a problem that probably requires human intelligence, I will ask you, the human, to make the change. So, I'm just going to uh, go into the repository and make a modification which I know will result in a merge conflict. Um, caps, no. right? Uh, we're currently in feature one, switch to main. Git switch to main, pardon me. Um, cat temp, did it temp. By the way, um, I've had the same file open in the text editor the whole time. It doesn't understand anything about what's going on with the repository. From the perspective of the, um, of the text editor, some other program is overwriting the contents of the file which is what this yellow bar is about. Um, it's, it's, it's good because it actually does that. Something like Notepad and Windows probably wouldn't. Unless it does, who knows. Anyway. This will cause a conflict. There we go. Save. Git add. Git commit. There we go. So, we take a look at the log. You'll see that uh, now main branch has had two commits since the split, but feature one has only had one. Let us attempt to merge feature one. Git merge. Git bit. Git merge feature one. Auto merging temp conflict. Merge conflict in temp. Automatic merge fail. Fix conflicts and then commit the result. So, this is what happens when it produces a merge conflict. And this is like probably the best. This is another reason why Git has beaten out all of its competitors because most other competitors have a much more clumsy way of doing this. Um, so if we get a temp, right, this is what it inserts. Notice this addition did not cause a merge conflict. However, line two was the same, or was modified in different ways in the two different branches. Thus, when Git attempts to merge the two files together, it inserts the following. Head branch says this, feature one says that, pick one. And your job as the programmer is to go in manually with a text editor and pick which one of those two options you want. So for example, maybe I think that the correct solution in this case is to put the both of them together. Right? 
or delete one, keep the other, or you know, take a thing here and put it in there and keep that, you know, whatever it is that makes sense to do with the file to mod to manage that merge, that's what you have to do. If this is a code file, the code after merger should still work, right? It's when this is programming code, this is a programming task. You select uh, which lines get um, you know, saved, which ones get deleted, and how they get modified. It tells you where the problem is, you fix the problem. Um, incidentally, if it's like more than one line, it doesn't like do this individually for each line, it'll collect up lines so you'll get like blocks of code that are different across different things. Make sense? Any questions? Is it just me or is it getting humid in this room? Mm. Just a little bit? We're going to get them perfectly outside and that's like 40 degrees. I'll take anything. I heard 42 is supposed to get up to. Oh, I was just exaggerating. 42? Yeah, with the humidex it's supposed to get up to 42 today. It's terrible, right? Can I like stay in this room like for the it. entire day and like just melt me until it comes on? I mean... I, I can't stop you. And if I you don't want to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. Let's just let's just all camp out here until like nine o'clock at night. Eh? No, vote for someone to get us food. Ooh. So we can survive. Well, no, we'll have to draw straws. No, I say we do survive or something. We vote. I think you can survive for ten hours without food. Yeah. I don't know. In a, locked in a room with uh, you know thirty cranky undergraduates who had no needs all day. I don't know. But, um, anyway, so just a couple of more things to uh, to cover before we uh, before we, we wrap up for today. The con a conflict happens when a br ma uh, branch merger can't be resolved automatically. Fixing conflicts is your job as the programmer. This is you. This is what your job is. Um, in large part in some cases. So the general workflow is when a conflict occurs, Git puts something like this uh, in the file of the conflict, um, which we've already seen an example of. So when this occurs, the easiest fix is to open this file in your favorite text editor, Emacs obviously, and manually make the changes. This requires you to actually read the conflicting lines and figure out what the solution would be using your human brain meat. If the computer could figure it out, it would have. Computers are not omniscient. They don't like computers are dumb as dumb as beans. And human beings are still required to program them, despite what Elon Musk thinks. Um, he makes good cars, but sometimes, man. Anyway, so once you have resolved the conflicts, or as, uh, or as you are resolving the conflicts, like maybe as you're in the process of resolving the conflicts, commit and push your changes so that they are fixed for everyone and not just you. Uh, that is the step that I forgot. I fixed the conflict, but I did not get add dot get commit. Uh, oh, I didn't do the message. Sure, that's a good message. There we go. Git push. There we go. Now, if we take a look at the graph, you will see the main uh, the um, the main branch is pulled all the way up here. We have this other branch that comes off, gets merged back in, and we have another commit right there. Make sense? So, fixing conflicts is a major pain, and many team workflows have a, uh, conflict avoidance as a top priority. This is why you try to avoid having multiple people working on the same portion of code, because it creates merge conflicts. Like, merge conflicts. And, uh, and avoiding the creation of them is like a really important thing if you're running a company that you expect to be profitable. Um, let me finish the slide. That said, they are an inevitable. They are also inevitable. 
So you're going to need to figure out how to deal with them. Sooner or later, you'll have merge conflicts. Rolling back to a previous version, even if it's just as a fact-finding mission, can be of crucial importance. Taking a look at what the code looked like before the new branch merger occurred can be extremely valuable. The, re the history of the repository is an information resource, and if you do not avail yourself of it, you probably cause yourself problems. And the last slide is a comic. What was your question? Uh, is the log, can the log be the here before um, can the which log? What? Deadlock. Deadlock? Yeah. Deadlock. Oh, deadlock. Um, so the problem with deadlock is that um, just like if you have a lock on a particular file, yeah. that does not necessarily mean like files can be quite large. You know, two people can be working on the same file, but not at all touching what each other are doing. Right? So if you were to use a deadlock like, or some other type of mutex on that type of situation, um, you're preventing useful work that might be occurring. Right? You want to you want to combine an approach of like, you know, you, you basically you want to balance data stability with data flexibility, because the flexibility is what allows your developers to work quickly and effectively, right? Make sense? Cool. Any other question? Nope? Okay. So it's just a trade-off. Yeah, it, well, everything's a trade-off, yeah. Um, the, um, like the older styles and the way that operating systems deal with the same problem is using, uh, using deadlocks and, or, uh, you know, mutexes and semaphores and that sort of thing, right? Um, but in this rapidly evolving internet age, we need modern problems, modern solutions for modern problems. Um, good. All right. Um, well, I think I've yammered on long enough for this morning. Um, are there any further questions? Okay. Um, all right. See you next week. Next week. We